Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager, and you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi folks, welcome to Astronomy Live. Tonight I'm going to be doing a Q&A session and tutorial for how to use my SAP Tracker software, which is available as free open source code in the video description. But also, channel members get ac exclusive access to a compiled executable of SAP Tracker as well as Rocket Tracker, my rocket tracking program. So if you join as a channel member, you can download the latest version of Sat Tracker. I will be releasing a new version shortly to handle high definition cameras. And so uh, that's really the benefit to stay, staying subscribed as a member is access to updated compiled executable, execu executables as I update the program. But uh, tonight I'm going to be going over how Sat Tracker works and uh, how you can use it to track various low Earth orbit satellites. So Sat Tracker is really designed to make it easy to track satellites like the International Space Station automatically and at high magnification by using video-based tracking to keep the satellite centered in the view while it's also tracking based on the orbital elements of the satellite. So first step in operating Sat Tracker is to make sure first of all that your computer clock is synced to the current time. I recommend going into Windows and syncing your clock uh, to the current time if you haven't done that lately. And then uh, downloading the orbital elements for whatever it is you want, want to track. So for example if you go into uh, date and time on Windows pull this window over here if it will let me. Here we go. You can click the sync now button and sync up your computer clock. That's the first step to make sure your computer clock is synced because it's going to it's going to run based on your computer clock to determine where the satellite currently is. The next step is to download the orbital elements for the satellite that you want to track. So uh, I use spacetrack.org. Uh, that's the website you see in the background here. You have to set up an account with Space Track, but you can also get the orbital elements from other websites, including Heavens Above and Celeste Track. So, for example, if you want to use spacetrack.org, what you probably want to do is perform a search for the satellite that you're going to track tonight for practice. We're just going to be tracking SDO, but not really. It's cloudy out there, so I can't really track anything at the moment. And uh, we're just going to use SDO as a simple um, practice target but without actually tracking it because again it's cloudy outside. Also SDO is a uh, geostationary, or not, it's not geostationary, it's geosynchronous. It's in a high geosynchronous orbit. You wouldn't normally see it with the finder camera. Um, so it's not a great target for sat tracker normally because you need a finder camera on top of your telescope to do video based tracking and a small finder camera just isn't going to see this particular satellite all that well. But it works well for practice because it's kind of somewhat stationary. It's not really geostationary. It slowly moves, but it's I can count on it pretty much always being up there. Uh, so I just like to grab it as a practice target. So once you've found it in the satellite catalog for space-track.org, you can click on the latest LSET TLE right here. This is the file you need for Sat Tracker. So it will pull up a file and you see all these numbers here. You're going to want to copy this. You're going to want to highlight this whole set here and control C, copy that, and then open up a notepad and uh, paste that in there. So I've got a notepad over here that has that element set pasted into it. You're also going to want a third line. You're going to want to create a third line up at the top that has the name of your target, whatever it is you're going to be tracking, followed by what you paste in from uh, space-track.org. Then you're going to want to save this as a text file. So save that as a text file that you can get to within Sat Tracker, and that's going to help you uh, track the satellite. So we're going to need that in just a moment. So I've got the orbital elements now, and I'm going to be practicing tonight using an AutoStar 
uh, sorry, not auto star. That's a Freudian slip there. A uh, Celestron Next Star uh, telescope. So this is a, a Next Star 4SE, and I've got the software for it running here. So in the case of Celestron telescopes with Next Star based computer systems, uh, you'll have Next Remote. Uh, that you want to download and install on your computer. And this will allow you to connect to your telescope uh, through the Celestron software. And then you can connect to it separately in other programs using ASCOM. So you're going to want to download the uh, ASCOM platform, ASCOM, and you're going to want to download the driver specific to your telescope, in this case, an, a Celestron uh, universal driver that will allow me to connect to it uh, with SatTracker. But first, before you run SatTracker, you need to run NextStar's uh, own software. In the case of the LX200 that I use, this isn't a necessary step because it's not using the ASCOM platform and it's not using any kind of uh, go-between software. Next Remote acts like a go-between between the SatTracker software and the telescope itself, but that doesn't exist for the LX200 for what, for what I do there. Uh, so I would just pick that as my telescope type in SatTracker directly, and, and SatTracker would directly talk to the telescope. In this case, though, we're going to use ASCOM Alt AS, which is a universal driver set, and that will communicate to the telescope through uh, Next Remote. But Next Remote must be fired up first and aligned, and you have to do the alignment. Importantly, you have to do the alignment using this guy right here, not the physical handset, which looks just like this. The physical handset on the telescope will have a separate alignment than what you're seeing here. This is essentially emulating the software that's running on the telescope. And so it needs to be aligned using the actual interactable um, device here, the, the window here for Next Remote. So I've got a simulated alignment, a simulated one star alignment. Of course, I'm indoors, so I can't see the stars, but I just pointed the telescope up roughly at where a star would be and then uh, aligned it in Next Remote. So now it's ready to go. If you don't do an alignment in Next Remote, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. It's not going to report accurate coordinates to my software. My software will tell it where to point, and the telescope's not actually going to point where it should. So you don't want to do that. Uh, with uh, rocket tracker though, it's all relative tracking. That's a very different um, tracking method right now, and so it's not actually necessary to align the telescope at all uh, for rocket tracker. But that's a whole another story. We'll get into that some other night. Uh, I'll do a separate tutorial for that because that's a, a quite a different process. Uh, so for sat tracker though, you do need to align it. So I've got it pseudo aligned on a simulated star. And uh, that's what we that's what we need for doing a practice run here. So let me just make sure I got the live chat pulled up. So feel free to jump in with any questions. Anyone watching, if you have any questions about uh, how this all works, or you want me to go over anything, just let me know in the chat. I had some questions from members about uh, my software and uh, how it all works. So yeah, feel free to jump in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, for some reason, I can't pull the chat up on my phone, which is kind of an interesting thing. I'm not sure why that's happening. Is it because I got it pulled up on my computer? That doesn't make any sense. Hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> now I'm scared the chat's not working. Okay, Andrew, I see you in the chat. So I know the chat's working. It's just not working on my phone for some reason right now. But that's neither here nor there. So we'll get right into it. So uh, the next step, you've got the... You've got the orbital elements downloaded. You've synced your computer clock. You've got the telescope aligned in Next Remote. Now the next step is to fire up Sat Tracker. So you fire up the executable, and initially you won't see this window right here. I've got it already fired up though, and I've already started uh, showing images from the camera that's mounted on the telescope because I needed to do that before firing up OBS to stream so that I made sure that OBS didn't override uh, the camera. Uh, the access to the camera for Sat Tracker, so had to have the right order of operations there essentially. Uh, so normally you wouldn't see this though; you wouldn't see the camera screen right away. And you need to select which camera you're going to use uh, with this right here. So the camera number in the window, uh, you want to set this normally. I set it starting at the number 700, and I'm not entirely sure why this is. But on Windows, with uh, Windows 
compatible cameras, and th that's what you need to use here. You need to use a camera that Windows will recognize as a video camera through Direct Show. Uh, you can select your camera by putting in an index number that corresponds to that camera. The index starts at zero, but uh, I'm not entirely sure how that all works. It seems like it's running through some sort of other middleman if you start at index zero, but the the indices all seem to be repeated in the 700 range, from 700 to 701 to 702. So the first camera on your computer, if you're using a laptop like I'm using right now, the built-in webcam will normally be index number 700 as well as index number zero. Um, the bottom line is I like to operate on the uh, indexes, that the indices that start at 700 uh, because it feels a little bit faster, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. Somebody who knows OpenCV better than I do can probably explain that. Uh, and yes, BMM, I did code this software myself in Python. It uses OpenCV to grab these images from the cameras, and then uh, it calculates the orbital elements of the satellite to track it and do video-based tracking through OpenCV to keep it centered. So, <clears throat> starting at index 700, you will have your, your built-in webcam. Uh, if you go to 701, that will normally be the next camera that's attached to the uh, computer, such as a finder camera. Uh, so I've got a, a sort of a webcam-style camera that's uh, mounted on the telescope right now. It's just mounted on top of the strap. It's not exactly uh, well secured, but for, per for practice and demonstration purposes tonight, it's fine. Obviously, for, re for real tracking of satellites, you want a, a nice stable mount on top of your telescope of some type, either some sort of Lossman derail system or a camera bracket mount that sits on top of your telescope that you can attach a proper camera to. All right, so I've got the camera set ready to go, so all you have to do is click Start Camera, and it'll start feeding images like so. Now, the telescope is moving here. It's, it's tracking along at what it expects uh, to be the motion of the sky, essentially. But I'm going to override that here and just move it up. So we've got this air conditioning vent on, in the ceiling right now that it's pointed up at. Uh, and now we're going to pick the satellite that we're going to track. So how do we do that? Well, it's not very, it's not very uh, complicated right now it's pretty simple it's only going to read the first set of orbital elements in any given text file that you feed it it'll look at the first three lines and pull those lines for the satellite to be tracked so you want a clean text file if you have a uh, a text file or a tle file that has a bulk catalog of satellites uh, right now in the current version of sat tracker i don't have a way of selecting which satellite out of a bulk catalog to track you want to feed it a clean text file that has the satellite you're interested in up at the top in the first three lines of the text file. So if we look at that text file I showed earlier, again, uh, the first line is going to be the name of the satellite. It could be anything. It doesn't really matter as far as my program is concerned. It's not going to care. It's really going to look at the next two lines, uh, the orbital elements, but it needs to be in a three-line format. That's what it's going to expect, and that's what it's going to look for. So you've copied the orbital elements from whatever website you got them from. You want them to be recent. Uh, if you're using very old orbital elements, they're going to be different now, and it's not really going to work all that well. So you want to download, generally download your orbital elements the same day that you do your tracking. Uh, you've got that file. You're going to load that file in Sat Tracker. So you're going to uh, click on the dialog box up here, File, select TLE file, and it's going to bring up uh, an option for that. So you're going to pick the uh, text file that corresponds to the orbital elements that you're going to track and you're going to click open on that. So then you should see down here uh, the file should be selected. So at that point now you're ready to select your telescope type. We're going to pick as column out as. That's the type of telescope we're going to be using tonight. Uh, and we're going to connect the scope. So you just click, click connect scope button. You're going to do the drop down. Pick your scope out of the ASCOM driver set uh, to pick from. So it's going to be Celestron telescope driver for this and click OK. And it'll take a moment and now it's going to connect to the telescope. And now it's connected, so it's ready for that. So uh, the next step is to calibrate the viewfinder camera. So to do this, you have two different tracking types to choose from, feature tracking or brightness-based tracking. If you're tracking on stars and things like that, brightness-based tracking generally is going to make the most sense. But since 
we're doing a practice run indoors here tonight, uh, that's not going to work so well. There's no particularly bright objects in the field of view to track. So I'm going to do feature-based tracking instead, which is more CPU intensive. It's going to be a little bit of a slower tracking process. But as long as you have a, a relatively high spec computer, it should be okay. If you've got a very low spec computer, this feature could be a little bit sluggish uh, because it's pretty CPU intensive. So we've selected our file, but we are not quite ready to start tracking yet because we need to calibrate the image scale. We need to teach the telescope how far it's got to move to get a corresponding motion in the viewfinder camera. So before you click start tracking satellite, you don't want to have clicked this button yet. You want to click somewhere in the image, something to lock onto, some distinctive feature, left click on it and it will produce a green tracking box around it. So now it sees the edge of that vent. Uh, let's pick, pick right there, a nice distinctive corner of that vent. And then we're going to click cal camera calibration. Okay, it's going to start moving the telescope, and it will generally try to move that green box towards the red box. The red box is wherever your telescope's center is. Uh, you're, you can redesignate that, and I'll show you how in a second. So it moves it down about 100 pixels, and it figures out the image scale. So it's got the image scale now, and to undesignate that target, you right-click. Just right-click in the window, the green box goes away. So left click to designate a target, right click to undesignate the target. This applies throughout the entire program. Left click designate, right click undesignate. Uh, when we get into it, when you're tracking a satellite, if you right click and undesignate the target, it will forget uh, the offset. It will forget how far it tried to travel to find whatever it is you clicked on to lock onto it as the target. So when you start tracking the satellite, it's initially going to be based purely on the orbital elements. But if the satellite is a little bit off from that orbit or your alignment isn't all that good, you're going to see the satellite appear somewhere else in the viewfinder and you're going to click on it to try to lock onto it. But if you miss and actually click on the wrong thing, it could go off in a random direction trying to find this, this thing that you've clicked on. It could be the, you know, the wrong thing. Um, if you right click, it will undo all of that. It'll go back to pure orbit based tracking and forget the offset that it just applied to the orbit. Okay, so. We've got the camera calibrated now. The next step would normally be to align the telescope to the viewfinder camera. So let's say I, I move it so that I get uh, the, let's say I'm gonna, I've got the edge of this corner of the vent right here in my view. Let's say this is a star and I've got that star in the main telescope view. Okay, and I, I've got that, that centered in the main telescope. That's where I want the program to drive the satellite to. I want the telescope to put the satellite in that position, or rather I want the program to put the satellite in this position in the viewfinder window. So regardless of the fact that the viewfinder is pointed a little bit off here, you don't have to realign the, where the viewfinder is pointed. You just have to tell the program where to put the satellite so that it will appear in the main telescope view. Okay. So again, we're looking here with a viewfinder camera, not through the main telescope, but on a secondary camera on top of the main telescope. So it could be pointed in a slightly different direction uh, than the main telescope itself. So if you click set center point and you click where the main telescope is actually pointed, it will reposition that red box. Now I wasn't quite as accurate as I wanted to be on clicking that corner, so I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard, just the, the regular arrow keys on the keyboard. Oh. Uh, but I have to have, uh, sorry, I have to have it clicked here. Oh, that's an interesting bug. I've not seen that one before. Huh. Okay, I've gone and done a thing. I've gone and done a thing. Apparently highlighting text in this text box has overridden my functionality of being able to, uh, of being able to move the red box. That's an interesting thing. Well, not really. It's still moving the red box. It's also moving through the <laughs> it's also moving through the text box, which is not really what I want. But I don't have a way around that. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's a goofy thing. It doesn't really matter because it's still moving the red box as I move the arrow keys. So if I if I click the arrow keys left and right, you know, you can see it's moving the red box left and right. For example, it's also moving the cursor in the text box, but eh, who cares? Um, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, if you if you end up having to move it up a bunch and you're at the top of the text box, you can always just highlight the text on down like this with your mouse cursor and, and fix it to get back to the current message. 
because uh, that message box will still be useful once we start tracking here. So, so we've got the orbital elements loaded, we've got the camera calibrated, we've got the viewfinder theoretically positioned uh, to be at the same uh, co-alignment with the main telescope. So we've set the red box where we need it to be to steer the telescope and get the satellite uh, to end up in the main camera view. All we have to do now is click Start Tracking, but there is a little bit of a catch that in the current version of Sat Tracker, it's not going to tell you where the satellite is ahead of time. So although we've loaded the orbital elements, eventually I want to change this. Uh, initially I didn't do this because I wasn't sure how much processing overhead, excuse me, processing overhead it would cost. But eventually I want it to show live coordinates of the satellite altitude and azimuth for your location. Ah, speaking of your location, I forgot to mention, you should also put in your location, definitely. Before you start tracking, put in your latitude and longitude. I've got it censored out here so that I'm not doxing my own location, but um, I think in the publicly released version it doesn't put stars there. Um, if it does, I apologize and I'll fix that, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't in the publicly released version. It's just a special thing that I do for myself since I'm live streaming this all the time. Uh, I don't want to accidentally show my coordinates. Uh, but nevertheless, you want to put in your latitude in uh, north positive and longitude in east positive. You can put in west longitudes, say, you know, 80 degrees west for Florida, roughly, uh, as a negative number. So it would be negative 80 degrees for west. Um, so that's how you do that. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to put it, you're going to put in a negative number for southern latitudes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, though, how well the program works in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I want to say I noticed something one time that was kind of odd about that, but I haven't tested it in the Southern Hemisphere yet, obviously. Um, if I get back down there one day, I'll, I'll do a test down there. But if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, let me know. Try it out and see if, you, see if it works okay for you. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we'll move on to actually tracking the satellite. So we've got our satellite loaded. We've got our camera calibrated. We've got our camera aligned. The telescope's connected, the camera's running, so all we have to do now is start tracking satellite. Acquiring object. So normally, if, uh, if you're tracking a satellite, object acquired. Ah, so you, heard, you probably heard it over the microphone there, uh, object acquired. So it's locked onto it now, and you see these delta as, delta out numbers. So this is showing the angular separation between where the telescope's pointed and where the program is trying to point the telescope. And it's a very small number, 0 0.002 to 3 degrees in each direction. So, you know, a very, very tiny delta there. So it's holding on pretty close to where it's trying to point to keep it on the satellite. Uh, and it is uh, doing a pretty good job there. Um, but now, let's say we're actually tracking a low, or pretend for a moment, we're tracking a low Earth orbit satellite and it's somewhere else in the view. I'm gonna show you what you do. All you do is you just have to click on what it is you're trying to track. Um, now, obviously right now, uh, just looking at a blank ceiling, not a whole lot of interesting stuff to look at, but if I just click on something down here, it should lock onto that pattern in the ceiling. Yep, and it uh, tries to go for that. Uh, now we're actually pretty close to that error conditioning vent again, so I can click on like that screw, for example, and it will lock onto that and center up on that and say, okay, I see, you, you see where the satellite is in the viewfinder, I'm going to trust you, human, on that, and it will use that as an offset uh, to keep it locked on target. So it's tracking actively now that little screw on the air conditioning vent and uh, using that as the target to lock onto. It's still feeding in uh, tracking data based on the orbital elements. In this case, that satellite is geosynchronous. It's barely moving, and so it's it's not too hard to fight against that, essentially, uh, to keep it where it's currently pointed on a stationary piece of the ceiling. Um, so that's why I'm using SDO here as an example tonight. Since we don't have any actual satellites we can track with the clouds, um, uh, I'm just using this as an example of how to do it. So, yeah, um, with... Um, with the feature-based tracking, though, it continually relearns the feature, and so when you have a satellite that's moving very slowly, like SDO, you'll notice it is drifting, and it's actually updating 
the reference image on the right. This is the reference image it's trying to lock onto. But because it's very gradually moving, it's actually forcing the reference image to change slowly over time. So it will gradually drift. Not normally an issue because, again, normally if you're tracking a satellite, you're tracking a bright object. Um, you would normally use brightness tracking, um, especially if you're tracking the space station or the Hubble Space Telescope or something like that. So not even an issue there. Uh, the feature-based tracking is most useful in SatTracker as a calibration tool. So if you're trying to calibrate the camera during the daytime or on a distant object in the horizon that isn't necessarily bright, but it's just something distinctive that you can see, you can use feature-based tracking to do that. And, it, and the camera calibration process itself should operate fast enough that you don't get that kind of drift uh, of the feature. So. Uh, yeah, that's the basics there of how you track a satellite with a uh, sat tracker. Uh, again, normally you would want to use this on low Earth orbit satellites like Space Station, Hubble Space Telescope, even Starlink satellites. I've tracked all these things with this program. Uh, and this is the basics of, of how you do it. The first step, again, uh, you're going to want to set your computer clock, sync that, make sure that's synced, download your orbital elements load up the program, uh, load up next remote if you're using a Celestron scope like this, align it, uh, align your scope. If you're using next remote, make sure you're using the next remote program to do the alignment. And then uh, you can start into Sat Tracker, starting your camera, connecting your scope, uh, making sure you've got the right camera selected on the camera number here. The COM port is only used for the LX200 right now. If you're using an LX200 Classic like I am, uh, this is going to be the serial port that you're going to connect to uh, on that telescope. Um, you're going to cam calibrate your camera, set your center point to be co-aligned, uh, put in your location, load your file using the file, uh, select TLE file, and then, oops, and I crashed the program. Uh, and then you're going to start tracking. So, yeah, I, I went and crashed the program there, which is uh, not brilliant. Um, that's going to make a mess for me, unfortunately, because I was in the middle of tracking while I did that. So note to self, don't, uh, don't click File while you're in the middle of tracking. Um, that will cause an error. It's a pretty nondescript error, too. But... Uh, yeah, it's not not expecting that. At the moment, Sat Tracker doesn't do a whole lot of sanity checking. If you like put in a non-number in one of the dialog boxes, it's expecting a number like the camera, uh, the camera index number, for example, and you try to run with that, it's it's not going to be happy with you. So at the moment, it expects the user to uh, be pretty on point with um, how it's working, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you're not, then it's it's not going to be so so happy with you. Yeah. So let me see if I can get it running again here. I could be up the creek because it also if it crashes, uh, if it crashes while it was connected to an ASCOM telescope, it really does not like that at all. Acquiring oh, object. Okay. We get lucked out. All right, so it actually came back to life on me. That's good. Object acquired. Oh, access rotate buttons has no object. E. Disconnecting the scope. Stop camera. Yeah, it. Uh, It does not like me right now. Telescope is already connected, so see, I think Acquiring it, object. I think it's unhappy with me at the moment because I crashed it while it was in the middle of trying to track object acquired. track the target. Yeah, see, that's oh, I understand why. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand what it is. It's not going to, see, now it's not going to track on me. So what I've gone and done to it is because the program crashed while it was connected and actually running the telescope, it failed to close that connection cleanly, and that connection remained open. And when it tried to reconnect, 
it was already connected. And so it's listening for something the telescope tells it when it initially connects. The telescope will say, oh, hi, you're connecting to me. Here's the fastest speed I can do. It, the telescope through ASCOM will normally tell the program, here's the fastest slew rate that I am capable of. And the pro my program needs that information so that it doesn't oversteer, so that it doesn't try to command a rate that is higher than the telescope can handle because that will crash it. Um, and because it was already connected and it didn't close that connection, the telescope thinks that it was still connected to the scope. Bottom line is it did not reply with the maximum slew rates that it's capable of. So my program never got to listen for that uh, on the, when, I, when I ran it again. And so now it doesn't know how to move the telescope. It doesn't know what its limits are, so it's not going to try to make the telescope move beyond the initial slew. It'll, it'll feed the initial coordinates of the satellite into the, pro, into the telescope, and that's what it did there. That's why it seemed to go to the satellite. But it won't then feed in the drive tracking rates because it doesn't know what its limits are. Uh, so I can try to disconnect the scope, but it's not really closing the connection properly because it got interrupted in the middle of it. Um, and I think if I try it again, it's it's still not going to work. I tried to close it separately just now, uh, like that. Telescope is already connected. Yeah, it's not. It's Acquiring not, object. It's not going to see. It's not going to track. It's not going to. Yeah, it did not object receive. Acquired. It did not receive the max slew rates from the scope, so it cannot uh, properly work. So that's cool. Anyway, that's my fault. Uh, but hey, <laughs> pro tip there, don't click into the file menus while you're in the middle of tracking. Uh, make sure you stop your tracking first. That's the, the lesson learned on that one. But you know, other than that, it, it works uh, quite well. Uh, I've been able to film some really nice footage of the space station and other objects as well. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, Starlink satellites, all these things with this program, and this is how I do it. Um, so, doesn't seem like we got too many questions in the chat. Oh, one question: Does it work with EQ mounts too? Theoretically, yes, but it's totally untested. Uh, it will work with ASCOM equatorial mounts. Right now, it's on an Alta AS mount, but it is capable of working with equatorial mounts in theory. Uh, EQ six R Pro. I'm not familiar with that mount. Uh, I don't know if that will work with the move access method of, of ASCOM. Uh, the only mount that I've been able to physically test it on for ASCOM is the Nexstar line. The Nexstar 4SE, the Nexstar 6SE mounts uh, all work with it. But I have not been able to test it on other ASCOM mounts. And I have heard others who use EQMod, even though EQMod is supposed to support that method, it doesn't seem to work, and I don't know why. Um, I really don't know why or what's happening there. I've tried to use it with an emulator for EQMod, and it gives me different errors than what actual EQMod users are reporting with their physical telescopes. So there's something very strange going on there with EQMod systems, um, and I have not been able to crack that nut yet. Um, but the source code is openly available, so if you want to try to adapt it for directly talking to your telescope the way that I do with the Nec with, not with the Nexstar, but with the LX200, uh, you can do that. You can look at my code and see how I've done that. Uh, with the LX200, it's a lot more the LX200. It's a lot more complicated because the LX200 does not allow me to directly set the drive rates, so I have to have a a control loop that um, adaptively. Uh, closes the loop and figures out how far it needs to move the telescope to get it to achieve a certain uh, angular rate. It's a very goofy system. Um, with the next star, it's a lot more straightforward because it, the next star does allow me to directly set the drive rates. Uh, and so you can see how that's done in the code as well. Hey, Dick Dawson. Good to see you. Oh, you're, you're soldering something there, Andrew? <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's basically all there is to it, really. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is, uh, don't forget to hit record on your main camera. I did that last time tracking the space station during the live stream. Uh, I caught it midway through, fortunately, but, uh, yeah. Uh, the, you know, the Sat Tracker program, uh, is really currently only designed to run with, viewfinder cameras 
And some people have been using high resolution cameras. So I, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, the next step uh, and the next version will handle that a little better. Right now, it just accepts whatever images are coming from the webcam at their native resolution, which for small webcams and stuff is, you know, small sm um, standard definition cameras is, is just fine. But if you've got a really high resolution camera, it's going to resize this entire window to fit that. And that's not going to be so good for you. You'll, you'll lose the ability to even access these buttons. Uh, so I just didn't have enough future proofing on that. Again, this was all built and tested with my hardware, not necessarily your hardware. So uh, I don't have any super high resolution viewfinder cameras. I just have basic stuff. Um, I'm using an ELP camera that uh, you can get off Amazon for like 50 bucks or less. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm using right now. But if you are using a high resolution camera, the next step I'm going to uh, implement and I'll push it out to GitHub and release it as a compiled executable as well, will automatically size down the images from the camera to fit within the resolution of your monitor. I think I might, mm, yeah, I haven't really done that before. I know how to kind of do it, but um, I'm going to have to tinker around with that. I can size it down, that's not the issue. It's just uh, making sure I can pull in with Python, query the current um, screen resolution. Uh, there's probably a way to do that, but in any case, I'll, I'll figure that out. At the very least, I'll force it down to fit on a 720p monitor or something like that. Um, just go with the lowest comp denominator there and uh, make sure the images aren't too large from the camera. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. See above about the gravity tractor solution. Uh, what's that got? Uh, what's speaky biases and date? I was thinking about the gravity tractor problem from moving an asteroid. I think I have an emergency solution. Use the ISS instead of deorbit. Save for a gravity tractor. I see. Use the ISS as a gravity tractor. Yeah, I suppose you could. So yeah, uh, like I said, that's that's pretty much. Yeah, uh, which one you should use for tracking A to C on Nexstar or an EQ6? If you're gonna use tracking right now, I'd recommend the A to C because that's something that's along the lines of what I've tested with. I've tested on this 4SC is what I'm using right here. It's the same mount, it's just scaled up on the A to C, so it should work fine for that. The EQ6, uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, if that's using a Nexstar computer, it might be okay. If it's using an EQ mod system, probably not. Um, but I, I would stick with the A to C on Nexstar. It should work fine for that. Yeah, at the moment, it's it's tested to work on a Nexstar mount. Um, other mounts, your mileage may vary. And yeah, if you join as a channel member, you'll have access to uh, a compiled executable for download, so you don't have to install Python. That's basically the, the rationale behind that. Um, it supports the channel, supports me, um, but it also gives you access to skip a few steps, because otherwise you're going to need to install Python to run the source code. Uh, you're going to need to install various dependencies, including OpenCV, uh, PyFM, and others. And it's just a whole dance that you have to do installing these various dependencies to get it to run. Uh, versus just running an executable file straight away off your you know, Windows machine. It will, I believe, only run on Windows 64-bit systems. That was another issue somebody had. Uh, it will not run on Windows 32-bit, I don't think. It's compiled on 64-bit for 64-bit. So you're going to need to have Windows 10 64-bit to, to get it to go. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it. So any other questions before I wrap up the stream? That's really all this stream's for, just a quick tutorial on how to use Sat Tracker and uh, answer any questions about it. Uh, if not, thank you all for coming and uh, thanks for watching. I hope to see you again soon. We'll have another we'll have another live stream soon. Hopefully, uh, some more ISS tracking coming up and uh, more rocket tracking. Uh, I'll also do a tutorial on rocket rocket tracker, which is the other program that I've released uh, to channel members. I haven't released the source code to that one yet, and I keep getting questions about UFO tracker. Uh, UFO Tracker is capable of tracking de novo, 
using joysticks or video based tracking where it doesn't require any pre-knowledge of the trajectory but there were some concerns about that uh, specifically unfortunately it drew attention from some chem chemtrail conspiracy theorists who wanted to use it which I wasn't comfortable with uh, some of those guys can be real radical and uh, they may, may want to do some bad things to jetliners because they think they're spraying us with chemicals. So basically I had to pull that idea because um, I don't want them using it for bad things to airplanes. So uh, instead I implemented Rocket Tracker which is specific for tracking rockets. It's not intended for tracking anything else. It runs on data from flightclub.io and predictively tracks rockets similar to how Sat, -track to Sat Tracker predictively tracks satellites. Um, but that's still in testing and I'm doing some extensive testing right now with Red's Rhetoric uh, to be able to test out features including remote tracking, uh, being able to remotely control a telescope over the internet for tracking rocket launches, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see that in action. So that's all coming and uh, uh, stay tuned for more on that. Like I said, I'll be doing a tutorial video separately for for Rocket Tracker uh, once I've done a little more testing of Rocket Tracker. Uh, the predictive tracking features still only lightly tested. Um, there's still more testing to be done there, and uh, probably some bug fixes uh, to to take care of. So yeah, uh, thank you, Sam, for posting that in the chat. Yep, there's the source code for Sat Tracker. Rocket Tracker at the moment is only available to channel members as a compiled executable. I haven't released the source code for that at the moment. Um, might might do that later. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I feel entirely comfortable with that. I don't want anyone reversing it back to the UFO Tracker version that could just track anything, including airliners. Um, I know a lot of people have interest in doing that for innocent reasons, and that's fine. But I don't want it getting out to the hands of... Um, conspiracy theorists who may want to be doing bad things to airplanes or their pilots. I mean, that's just the unfortunate reality of the world we live in. So instead, I've got Sat Tracker out there. The source code's on GitHub, freely available. Rocket Tracker is available to channel members, uh, and so is a compiled executable of uh, Sat Tracker. Oh, could I write software that lets let you know when I go live? YouTube doesn't work. Yeah, YouTube really doesn't like me, I feel. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. I get people telling me all the time that it's not giving them notifications. Be sure to click the bell. Hopefully that, you know, turn on all notifications. Hopefully that will help. But it, it seems like some people who have actually done that are still not getting notified when I go live, um, which is unfortunate. Um, I try to tweet it out. So my Twitter handle, at Astroferg, uh, if you... Uh, follow me on Twitter. I try to always tweet out when I'm going to go live so that people can get notified. Uh, but of course, I've got a much bigger subscriber base here on YouTube than I do followers on Twitter, so not everyone's getting that. Uh, and I'm not sure what's going on with YouTube, but I, I kind of feel like I'm sort of blacklisted. Uh, not entirely sure why. Uh, but maybe, maybe because I mentioned things like uh, conspiracy theorists interested in airplanes and that kind of thing. I don't know. Even though I'm not promoting that, I'm you know, <laughs> I'm still blacklisted for it. Seems like. Uh, so Sam, you got the notification. Well, that's good. So some people are. Other people say they're not getting notified. I don't know what's going on. Maybe maybe some people haven't clicked the bell. Um, definitely click the bell, uh, and cl click uh, to turn on all notifications, uh, if you can. And hopefully that will help. But yeah, I, I get other people telling me all the time that they're having trouble getting notified yeah same same on your channel dick okay yeah i maybe it's not blacklisting maybe it's just uh just youtube being youtube but uh that's uh, unfortunate oh how do i get rid of coma uh is my telescope coma corrected great question so uh i do still have coma with my telescopes i have an eight inch elk standard classic it's not the advanced coma free one of the acf newer lx 200s uh, so it still has some significant coma towards the edge of the field of view of my deep space camera, um, especially when using the focal reducer. But most people don't seem to notice. Uh, it's not nearly as bad as coma on, say, like a Newtonian or something like that, where you get really severe coma. Um, uh, 
And yeah, you know, to, to really get better correction on that, I would just have to switch out the optics. Uh, maybe get an ACF uh, OTA, an optical tube assembly, to throw on the Alex 200. I love the, I actually love the classic electronics on the LX200. I, I'm not eager to replace that or go to AutoStar. Um, so I, I'm in no hurry to switch that over. But yeah, you know, uh, it is an issue in wider angle views. But the, the Schmidt Cassegrain design in and of itself is not too bad about that unless you're doing really crazy wide angle stuff. Um, with the ST2000 XCM camera that I use, it's it's not too bad. Yeah, uh, yeah, Sam. Uh, YouTube only gives three notifications in a day, but yeah, I hadn't uploaded anything today. Uh, I uploaded something yesterday, but um, have you ever thought about the Star Arizona coma corrector? Uh, no, not really. Uh, that's an interesting possibility. I haven't really looked into that. So they make a coma corrector for traditional Schmidt cast grains in? Is that the deal? I know I've, I'm familiar with Starzona kind of, and I think their products are good, but I haven't specifically looked at their coma corrector. So that, that would be an interesting possibility. What is that? Like a, is that like a replacement secondary or something to try to better correct the coma? Hmm. I'll have to look that up. Oh, yeah, you got a Canon full-size sensor on the A to C. Yeah, yeah, you would get a lot of coma with that. So if you go crazy wide field or, or crazy big sensor, um, yeah, you'll you'll notice a lot more coma. My, my ST2000 XCM is definitely not a full-frame full, size, full sensor. It's nowhere close to that. It's not even as uh, big a chip as, I think, the APS-C or whatever it is, the, the crop-factored SLR that I have. Oh, they have an SCT coma corrector 0.63. So it's it. I guess it doubles as a focal reducer, and a coma corrector. That's that's good. I've got a uh, supposed to be a field flattener slash uh, focal reducer 0.63, but it's not super high quality. I don't know. It was uh, Antares, I think, made it. It's like some sort of uh, lesser known third party manufacturer. It works, it gets the job done, but it's not super duper high quality. Know any videos about uh, this coma corrector anywhere on YouTube? So nobody's done any videos on it? Well, hey, if Starzona wants to send me one to test out and uh, do a review on, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me see here. Pull this over here. Just see if I can find anything on it. Coma, SCT Coma Corrector 4. 0.63x Coma Corrector. Is that T threads on the end? Hmm. Oh, it's shipping first quarter 2021. Okay, so whole new product. $400, $399. Man, I, I might be in the market for that if it's as good as they say. Oh. They could do with actually fixing their images though. When I try to go to the, like the full resolution images of the pictures they show, it doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's this this guy right here. Get this out of the way. Product out of stock shipping. Oh, maybe it's not a new product, I guess, but it's just out of stock. Well, that's cool. If it uh, gets back in stock, I'd. Kind of like to check that out. Some nice looking images there, but if I try to click on them, they don't uh, they don't come up. So they need to fix that. So, two inch barrel. So that uh, that's the one thing I don't like about the design though it doesn't use the SCT threads on the back which I guess makes some sense for other reasons but I do like the fact that my focal reducer uses the SCT threads on the back it just threads onto the back of the telescope directly instead of trying to use this 2 inch barrel thing 
Um, I mean, I can make it work. I've got a two inch star diagonal, but if I'm doing like launch tracking and this kind of thing, I'm not always using a star diagonal. If I can get away with just going straight in, I, I do that instead. Um, so I'm not too thrilled with that. Also, <laughs> the other big issue there, of course, I might not, might not have as much use for this as I thought now that I think about it. One of the big things is the reason I can use the focal reducer that I use is because it threads on the SCT directly uh, and just replaces the SCT threads, then I can adapt or I can attach the adaptive optics unit, which uses SCT threads. It's not, it's not using a two inch barrel or anything like that. It's threading directly onto the back of the telescope, which is very secure for the camera, but uh, not gonna work with a two inch accessory. Yeah, difficult for you to get your hands on it in China. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's that's tricky. Yeah, yeah, the fact that it's a two-inch accessory is kind of goofy. I mean, you've, you've got a product here that's dedicated for SCTs. Why wouldn't you use the SCT threads? I mean, that should be the first item in the optical train, I would think. I guess this way it's it's at the right distance from the sensor if you're using a star diagonal. I guess that's their rationale for it. But uh, I don't like it. It's in it's therefore incompatible with my adaptive optics unit and I'm sorry. I'll I'll take the coma over losing the adaptive optics unit. I do not want to take that off. The AO is a marvel of science. No, it's just it's a fantastic accessory for my scope. For the LX200 Classic, the mount is not high quality enough to use that for really good deep space imaging without the adaptive optics. Um, so, I get much better results with the AO7 on there. So, I'll live with my coma as it is. Bottom line. And for 300 bucks, I mean, come on, guys. Call me a break here. Oh well, I'll stop complaining about their choice of product design. All right, that's gonna do it for this stream, I think. Oh, uh, one question from SlickX. Can more than one telescope be mounted on a good quality mount given the weight isn't too much? I've seen it done. Uh, I have seen that done, but you do need a you know good mount with a high enough payload capacity to handle both scopes and whatever bracket you're using. And your bracket should be pretty rugged and, and a serious deal too. Um, you could also do piggyback. Like I've got my little 80 millimeter refractor that I throw up on top of my LX200 sometime, which is, by the way, ripe for replacement. That 80 millimeter refractor is just an acromat. Um, but yeah, you could do it that way. So you, you know, you can piggyback a smaller scope. Uh, I could do that on my LX200. It's just riding on on rail system on top of the telescope, but I have seen like side by side telescopes on a mount as well. I have seen that done, but you know, much smaller scopes individually than what the mount is really designed to handle on its own. All right. Well, I guess that's that's gonna about do it for this stream. I just realized I need to come back in here. Okay. So again, thank you all for watching, and uh, I'll see you all next time. Till then, clear skies, folks. <laughs>